Hi, my name is Nihan Kaya. I'm a Turkish writer. In Turkish, I have published 14 books so far. Um, five of them are novels and then two collections of short stories, two academic books on literature and psychology, two books on the child archetype, and I also published three children's books, one non-fiction and then uh, two fictions and several more children's fictions are going to be published soon. And I have been teaching Psychoanalysis and Literature 1, which is Humanities 313, and Psychoanalysis and Literature 2, which is Humanities 314, at MEF University Psychology Department for five semesters now. And these will be a series of videos which are taken primarily to share with the students who are taking these two courses, but they are going to be available to anyone who is interested. And in this series, I will mainly talk about art, literature and creativity. I will talk about the creative process, what is art and what is not art, whether we can talk about the possibility of an objective criteria to assess the literary value of a piece of literature or the artistic value of a work of art, the deep link between the self and creativity, which means the deep link between being and creating, and why to exist in the real sense of the word, actually means one's creating her own self. We are going to talk about the nature of creative writing, the psychology of creativity and the psychological study of creativity, the relationship between literature and psychology and the, uh, and the relationship between literature and the arts, and something else which is also related to all these things that I have men mentioned, which is the child archetype. The first two of these videos, they are going to be based on uh, two of my chapters, which have been published by Routledge so far. And this first video is based on a conference paper which I presented very, very long ago, way back in 2006. I uh, presented a paper at the International Association for Jungian Studies Conference at Greenwich University, London. And in 2008, a longer version of this conference paper was published as chapter one in this book, Dreaming the Myth Onwards, Revisioning Jungian Therapy and Thought, which is edited by Lucy Hoskinson. And this longer version includes more elements about psychotherapy, but what I will be talking about today is basically about how and why creativity is essentially nonconformist. I'm not someone who is very comfortable with camera, but I'm going to try to do my best. And we're going to start with the definition of creativity. And uh, creativity is not only in art, actually. Creativity can be in any sort of action. But I'm going to be talking mainly about art, because if we, if we can understand creativity in art, then we can understand creativity in other ways of life as well. So creativity is defined as the ability to bring something new into existence by Frank Barron. So anything that is created is new. And like anything created, all artistic products share the common characteristic of being new, authentic and highly subjective. And actually, it is this basic characteristic that bases the essential core of any artistic piece. Um, a piece would be considered to have no artistic value if it doesn't go any further than being just a copy of something else that already exists in nature. Like when a painter depicts a tree in nature, the portrait does not display the tree in nature anymore, but another unique and original tree with a capi capital T that is beyond that tree. And this beyondness is what makes the portrait a work of art rather than an ordinary version of reality. And I'm going to talk more about this uh, tree example in the next video. And I will also mention Rolla May's book, The Courage 
to create, which is uh, a very good book, really. And I'm going to read one sentence from this book in my notes. It is, um, you probably know the painter Monet. Monet painted the cathedral at Rouen 33 times. And Rollo says, Rollo May says, no matter how many times Monet returned to paint the cathedral at Rouen, each canvas was a new painting expressing a new vision, which is really a very important thing to uh, understand creativity. So um, the creative thing, it is always new. And other than that, a work of art is always more than the sum of the elements that it is composed of. Um, so think what is a novel made up of people would you would usually say would usually say um a novel is made up of uh the story the plot the technique um the language but each of these things the elements the components that make the novel each of these components might be very good standing alone but the novel may not be good the novel is either good or not and this is not really about the things the elements that it is made up of and the piece's artistic energy which is something that we're going to talk about in the following videos because there is something called artistic energy and we all have this energy even if it is not always converted to the creative act the piece's artistic energy is charged from the synthesis of these elements but it goes beyond their combination so this beyondness is the important word here art is not only an energic but also a synergic action so in art two plus two makes more than four and actually this is when art begins art begins at the point when two plus two makes more than four so it begins after four and an object's art emerges out of a synergy that the combination of its components have transformed. I'm going to give another definition, which is by Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand calls art a selective recreation of reality according to an artist's metaphysical value judgments. So when you are creating something, you are recreating um, you are recreating the reality. So even if when you're photographing an object, you are recreating this object if, if, if it is really a good photograph. And if it is a good photograph or picture, your photograph, your picture reveals more about the reality than the object itself. And in a way, it is coming up against the prevailing forms of existence because everything, uh, everything that exists exists in some form and there are some, prevail there are some prevailing forms. And when I define this cup, for example, um, when I define it, it is against this prevailing form. So I am saying to you in a way, I am against the way that uh, you impose the reality upon me. So, so it is uh, recreating reality because it's creating a new form, but creating reality through a new form. So the created work, it destroys the prevailing forms of existence because it is offering any form of its own inst instead. And Picasso said every act of creation is first of all an, an act of destruction, which is also true. And the work of art, it deconstructs the conventional, the official, the standardized in order to replace it with the individual, the authentic substitute that it is reconstructing. And think about the things that the artist is using if um, if, if literature is in question, for example, uh, they use the language, the words which are common to all of us. 
I remember Roland Barthes has a sentence. He says words belong to everyone, but the sentence, the sentence belongs to the writer. And anything that people are using, uh, artists are using when they are creating, these are very daily common things that we come across all the time in our daily life. They are using paints, images, stones, musical notes, and uh, maybe you know about Plotinus, who was a very important philosopher of the third century. And Plotinus also said that it is not the stone that, that is precious, it is the shape, it is the form that the artist gives to the uh, stone. And uh, yes, these are the things, the material that the artist is using. These are common to everyone, but the keynote of, uh, of the art is concealed within the nuances through which the artist uses these differently from the way that everybody else does. The poet, for example, the poet takes the words that are communal and that, that, that function by being communal and by clipping, intertwining, distorting their conventional meaning and, useless, and usage, she transcends them into another network of language out of which the art of poetry is born. So a peculiar language with a capital L is created from the language that functions as a medium in this process. And it is impossible to speak of any artistic stir where everything conforms to the established order because the established is a standstill. Art, on the other hand, is perceived as a stir. Either when it stirs the mind of the artist to come into life, to be produced, or when it reaches out to those, the audience, who are able to be moved by this work of art. I'm going to read three sentences by this wonderful book, The Dynamics of Creation by Anthony Storr. So this book is uh, in my top list with Rollo May's The Cour Courage to Create, um, about arts, creativity, and psychology. And still, I mean, for about 16 years. So Anthony Storr says, most authorities who have studied creative people agree that one of their most notable characteristic is independence. This shows itself particularly in the fact that they are much more influenced by their own inner standards than by those of the society. Another interesting aspect of this trait of independence is the fact that the highly creative belong to fewer organizations and social groups than do their less creative contemporaries. Okay, this is the end of the uh, quotation. And uh, the idea to be lies crucially hand in hand with the idea to create. And in the preface of this book, which uh, I already talked about, The Courage to Create, Rola May uh, says that creativity is a necessary sequel to being. And the title of this book, The Courage to Create, is derived from Paul Tillich's book, another book that I'm going to mention today, which is The Courage to Be. And all these things, this relation between being and creating, reminds us of another favorite psychoanalyst of mine, Winnicott. Winnicott studied creativity both in infants and in adults. And uh, there is a term by Winnicott that we are going to study. Integration, full integration, unintegration and disintegration. These are all terms that are used by Winnicott. And um, full integration means becoming one with one's environment, according to Winnicott. And in Winnicott's language, um, full integration means false existence. So you cannot really exist if you are fully integrated to, a, to an environment which already exists even before you were born in Winnicott's language. And um, so Winnicott calls this false existence and this false existence by compliance or full integration is associated with false self-living 
in Winnicott's language. According to Winnicott, every person is divided into a false and true self in some ratio or, or another, and he says only the true self can be creative. This is very important for me, and we're going to be talking about the relationship between the true self and creativity as well. And let me repeat it again, only the true self can be creative. I'm reading another two sentences from different essays of Winnicott. Winnicott says, the false self, however well set up, lacks something, and that something is the essential central element of creative originality. And at some other part, he says, it is only in being creative that the individual discovers the self. So when he is talking about the play of child, or the adult, this is what he is saying, and uh, creativity is the play of the adult. So this false self, which is explained by Winnicott as a polite or socialized self that each person develops to adapt to his or her environment, corresponds to persona, and Jung's understanding of persona really maybe is the closest that um, Winnicott sees it. The term persona is derived from the Latin word for mask, which used to be worn by actors in classical times to indicate the role that they played. And Jung defines persona as a mask of the collective psyche, a mask that feigns individuality, making others and oneself believe that one is individual, whereas one is simply acting a role through which the collective psyche speaks. And there is another definition, uh, which is also by Jung. He defines persona as a compromise between the individual and society as to what a man should appear to be. Because of its reformist nature, creativity has always been perceived as a threat to the collective consciousness, which aims to secure its continuity. And um, an American developmental psychologist, Howard Gardner, I'm going to read another paragraph by him from Art, Mind and Brain, A Cognitive Approach to Creativity. He's talking about Howard, Howard Gruber here. Gruber is, an, is another American psychologist who was a prominent figure in the psychological study of creativity. And Howard Gardner writes, Gruber reminds us of the difficulty and loneliness of any creative undertaking. Despite the pleasure that individuals obtain from their work, they are typically embarked on a solitary voyage, where chances of failure are high. To pursue the risk attack, they must be courageous and willing to deviate from the pack, to go off on their own, to face shame or even outright rejection. It requires a strong constitution to go it alone in creative motives, and most innovative people at times experience a strong need for personal, communal, or religious support. So we can see here that the created product resembles the child archetype, which represents the strongest, the most ineluctable urge in every being, namely the urge to realize itself, according to Jung. Jung says, nothing in all the world welcomes this new birth, although it is the most precious fruit of Mother Nature herself, the most pregnant with the feature, signifying a higher stage of self-realization. Jung has another term, individuation, which is something that we're going to talk about during this series. And individuation is, according to Jung, the process through which one becomes uh, what he or she really is, acquiring the ability to be an individual in a society of individuals, becoming individual, meaning an indivisible, indestructible whole. So the individual, when it's the real individual in the true sense of the word, the individual retains her unique, incomparable, separate self in spite of the community that she is still a part of. 
And here I'm going to mention this book again, The Courage to Be, because Paul Tillich talks about how in being you are both yourself, your own self, and a part of the community, the world, the society at the same time. This is something about uh, being. And so Paul Tillich writes, the self is a part of the world which it has as its world. And the world would not be what it is without this individual self. Therefore, another sentence by Jung, a person can meet the demands of outer necessity in an ideal way only if he is also adapted to his own inner world, that is, if he is in harmony with himself. Knowing also begins with one's knowing his or her own self. Once one cannot acknowledge the collective environment that surrounds her without the knowledge of her unique self, and becoming aware of oneself also means becoming aware of a surrounding environment that the self is distinguished from. And even this process of becoming aware is based on deconstruction. According to Winnicott and many other developmental psychologists really, the newly born infant does not realize the existence of its own self since it perceives itself to be one with its environment. So the realization of the self begins with the negation of this idea. And here negation is a term. It's a term of uh, Herbert Marcus, which is still something else that we're going to talk about. Herbert Marcus thinks that for true consciousness, negation or negative thinking is necessary. So this is who I'm referring to when I'm using the word negation here. So it means in order to become aware of something, we have to strip it bare from all collective values and primordial images first, and then to redress it ourselves. The more we are able to find to negate, the more self-consciousness we have gained. And for the reconstruction of an inner world, it is necessary for all ideas to be deconstructed and then reconstructed by the individual, even if it would be the same uh, set of values that will be reconstructed in the end. And awareness is going to mark itself as the, as the distinction between. And without such a personal deconstruction, the result would be what Jung calls the mass psyche, which destroys the meaning of both the individual and the culture. A sentence by Jung, Jung says, the bigger the organization, the more unavoidable is its immorality and blind stupidity. I'm going to read another paragraph by Jung. Jung says, an advance always begins with individuation, that is to say, with the individual, conscious of his isolation, cutting a new path through hitherto untrodden territory. To do this, he must first return to the fundamental facts of his own being, irrespective of all authority and tradition, and allow himself to become conscious of his distinctiveness. If he succeeds in giving collective validity to his widened consciousness, he creates a tension of opposites that provides the stimulation which culture needs for its further progress. And we're going to talk about these uh, opposites as well, and this is the end of the quotation. The history of humanity is also the history of the individual. Just as any progress within the individual takes place after the point that the person goes beyond the self that he or she has acknowledged so far, any sort of um, contribution, significant achievement that contributes to humanity is also achieved by the individual against the status quo of um, her society. And Jung says what is true of humanity in general is also true of each individual, for humanity consists only of individuals. And he says something else in, in a different essay. He says, all the highest achievements of virtue, as well as the blackest villainies, 
are individual. Think of the people, any person who has ever made a contribution to arts, humanities, or any other subject, like Buddha, John of Arc, Socrates, Galileo, Copernicus, and many others. These people were all ostracized as rebels by the society, and they were punished for the same thing that uh, we owe to them uh, today. So these individuals and their idiosyncratic potentials were not only ahead of their time and venue, but also beyond their time and uh, venue. So beyondness is something which is always related to creativity, and where there is creativity, there is also with and against, and the clash between these with and against. So someone goes beyond her like legacy uh, by means of the benefit of this legacy against this legacy when someone is creating. And as a matter of fact, the idea of reconstruction and deconstruction, the, these are so much intertwined throughout this creative process that there are some theorists who discuss whether it is possible that reconstruction comes chronologically before deconstruction. So art making is form making. And when you are form making, you are reforming the material and when you are doing this you are doing this with both wits and against and this is how you are going beyond the material and i remember actually presenting a paper which was called art as a challenge to its own object because art challenges the object that it is made up of and when we're going to study what art is and what art is not I'm going to try to explain it in more detail that uh, art lies in the transformation of, of its own matter and this is why it is going beyond its own material and transforming its own material. And another thing that um, wherever there is creativity, there is an idea of opposites and the union of opposites. And this is something that we're going to discuss in uh, next videos, because the creative energy, it emerges out of the dialectical tension between opposites. To name a few of these opposites for the creative process, they are discipline and inspiration, form and spontaneity, order and chaos, eros and legos, the internal and the external, the conscious and the unconscious. So these are the things which are always in action when we are talking about creativity. Even if it is one term of this pair that gives the created product its essential basic characteristic. Anthony Storr, in this book, again, The Dynamics of Creation, talks about opposites, and he says, creative people are distinguished by an exceptional degree of division between opposites, and also by an exceptional awareness of this distinction. So he says everybody has these uh, oppositions, but creative people have more oppositions, but they know how to control these opposing factors within. And he also writes that the divisions within him recurrently impel the use of his imagination to make new synthesis. And the process of creation lies parallel to the process of individuation that I mentioned. And um, Anthony Storr defines individuation as coming to terms with oneself by means of reconciling the opposing factors within. The motive force for creation is not destroying for the sake of destruction. And also it is important to note that um, it does not conform to any form of non-conformity. And I'm stressing that um, the created act is non-conformist, but it is not unconformist. It does not conform to any form of 
unconformism and also it is not irrational but it is suprarational and it is not random it is meaningful creativity seeks the whole uh, through its peculiarity just like individuation which doesn't take one away from the world but rather gathers the world to oneself because when you are coming closer to your own self it means you are close you are becoming closer to the universe so these are not really oppositions as uh, usually suggested and i'm going to read another paragraph from the courage to be about this Paul Tillich says, the barrier of this creative process is the individual who, as an individual, is a unique representative of the universe. Most important is the creative individual, the genius, in whom, as Kant later formulated it, the unconscious creativity of nature breaks into the consciousness of man. Men like Piccolo Mirandola, Leonardo da Vinci, Giordano Bruno, Shaftesbury, Goethe, Schelling were inspired by this idea of participation in the creative process of the universe. In these men, enthusiasm and rationality were united. Their courage was both the courage to be oneself and the courage to be as a part. The doctrine of the individual as the microcosmic participant in the creative process of the macrocosm presented them with the possibility of the synthesis. Art itself evolves through time and a type of art in a particular era becomes institutional just after a certain period of time and new forms of art are transcendent from this pattern and the counter function of the established not only in art but in all forms of art they offer a ground of criteria for the individual to transcend and Winston Churchill says something about this Winston Churchill says without tradition art is a flock of sheep without a shepherd without innovation it is a corpse in this video, I try to briefly summarize how and why creativity is essentially nonconformist. In the next video, I'm going to elaborate more on the characteristics of art and creativity. Thank you very much for listening to my video.